Okay, good morning everyone. Today is day 14 and we're looking at um, when God seems distant. Have you ever felt that? Have you ever felt like God was distant? Boy, I have. Um, we read about it in the Bible in many, the lives of many Christians. And let me read something that uh, Philip Yancey wrote. And it's really good. He talks about um, this difficulty. Philip Yancey said, any relationship involves times of closeness and times of distance and in a relationship with God. No matter how intimate, the pendulum will swing from one side to the other. And there are what many people call the dark night of the soul. I'm sure if you've walked with the Lord very long, you've experienced the dark night of the soul, the winter time of the heart or night time for the heart when God is teaching us many things, the ministry of absence. These are all descriptions of that time when God feels distant and it's a miserable feeling and frustrating, but it's part of our faith building and trusting to see if we, we really love God. Um, David frequently complained of God's apparent absence. Lord, why are you standing aloof and far off? Why do you hide when I need you most? Why have you forsaken me? Why do you remain so distant? Why do you ignore my cries for help? Why have you abandoned me? And you get the feeling in these passages that the Bible, sometimes I used to ask, well, I wonder why God put these in there. And they seem like complaining or he's accusing God of certain things, but it's not that way at all. David is actually being very authentic and real. And God included this in the Bible uh, because he wants us to be real and explain, to be honest about what we're genuinely feeling. Um, there's a book called The Wilderness, and the title itself obviously describes this period of time when maybe you're struggling. And in this book, Floyd McClung said, You wake up one morning, and all your spiritual feelings are gone. You pray, but nothing happens. You rebuke the devil, but it doesn't change anything. You go through spiritual exercises. You have your friends pray for you. You confess every sin you can imagine. Then you go around asking forgiveness of everyone you know. You fast, still nothing. You begin to wonder how long this spiritual gloom might last. Days, weeks, months. Will it ever end? It feels as if your prayers simply bounce off the ceiling. In utter desperation, you cry out, What's the matter with me? The truth is, there's nothing wrong with you. This is a normal part of testing and maturing of your friendship with God. Every Christian goes through it at least once, and usually several times. It is painful and disconcerting, but it's absolutely vital for the development of your faith. It's like in anything. The hardest times are usually growth times. When you're um, an athlete and you push and it's hard and you want to give up, that's when you get the most um, development and you, you grow the most. When you're um, going through, kids have a period where they call growing pains and their, their bodies can hurt. Sometimes they're growing so fast, their knees hurt or they feel like their bones are stretching or they don't quite know what's going on. But we see them can literally see their growth over a period of some kids grow so much in one summer, one fall, and you know what's happening. They're growing, but sometimes they feel pain from, from that growth. Well, there's uh, four things you can do if you're going through the dark night of the soul. Number one, tell God exactly how you feel. Just be honest. Pour out your heart to God. Unload every emotion that you feel. And if you read the Bible, God grants you that permission. And he says, it's okay. I want you to be honest. If you're really feeling this, then explain it to me. Share it. Tell me what you're feeling. And number two, focus on who God is, his unchanging nature. One, be honest. Two, focus on God, his unchanging nature. Remember who God is. Um, think about the things that he's done and, and his attributes. Number three, trust God. God's promises. Uh, trust God keeps his promises. We Sometimes we, people talk about um, counting the promises of God, naming, naming them, numbering them. And God's book is a promise book and he makes these statements. And because of who God is, it's a, it's a promise. If God says he's going to do something, that's a promise that he will fulfill. 
And that's why it's important to study God's Word as a promise book where you can um, you can hold these things dear to your heart and say, well, God said He's going to do this, and He promised. And God said if I believe in Him, He promised He would save me. God said that if I pray, then He will hear my prayer. God said that if I confess my sin, then He will forgive my sin. Um, God said that He's coming back. God said that He will take me to heaven. And that when I die, I will go to be with the Lord Jesus. And you begin to remember these wonderful, wonderful, extraordinary promises of God. And it helps you to remember that God did not, one thing God did not promise is he didn't promise that you would, that you would never have hard times. And so you remember it's like, hmm. So when I read the Bible, the great Christians had hard times, but he promised God he would bring them out. In Hebrews 11, that chapter of all the great um, believers it said they remembered that God promised them a city in heaven and they kept their focus on that and we get to do that okay number four remember what God has already done for you um, the greatest thing God has done for you is he sent his son Jesus and Jesus lived in this world for you and Jesus obeyed the law of God for you and Jesus endured persecution and suffering for you. And Jesus was silent when he was being accused for you. And Jesus endured mockery by the Jewish people, the Jewish leaders, for you. And Jesus endured the ridicule and scorn of Roman, the Roman government, and he did that for you. And Jesus was whipped and beaten and hit in the face and slapped and mocked for you. And Jesus had nails driven through his hands and through his feet and he was hung upon a Roman cross for you and he died for you. And then he resurrected and now he says that he will he has risen again and he will give eternal life to you. He did that for you. So when you begin to think that way, boy, doesn't it change. Lastly, I want to read uh, two psalms, or part of two psalms. And it kind of describes this scenario that we've been talking about today. In Psalm 102, the psalmist prays, desperately prays, Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my distress. Incline your ear to me. Answer me speedily in the day when I call. So you can hear him that he's in the dark night of the soul. He's in the winter. He feels desolate and forsaken by God. He says, hear me, God. Don't hide from me. Please answer in such a difficult situation. And then the very next psalm, Psalm 103, describes his moments of when he is fully considering how good God has been to him. Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. So when you're going through one of these experiences of the, the dark night of the soul, or it feels like winter in your spiritual life, um, remember to tell God exactly how you feel, to focus on God, who God is and his unchanging nature, to trust God to keep his promises, and remember what he's done for you. I think if you'll do that, then God will begin to um, draw close to you and he will um, delight you afresh with his presence. God bless you. You guys have a great day. Amen.